coming up on Man Enough. So my wife and I were in couples therapy. She said something that was a pivotal point for me. She said, you've always been feminist enough. The problem is that you're not masculine enough. Mm. I had thought that in order to be like a good partner and a good feminist and a good ally and good husband in the modern world, I somehow had to shrink myself. I had to become less. I wasn't engaging with her as an equal. I was actually retreating. And I think that's part of a broader societal challenge is that we need to rise together. We don't need one sex to become less for the other to become more. Zero sum thinking is the enemy. Being man enough, what does that mean? It's really manly to mess up, admit you're wrong and then grow. I couldn't accept that I was evil. So maybe I'm broken, but those broken things could be corrected. Intimacy between a father and a son is me just wanting to like put my head in your lap. I love you, son. You haven't called me a benevolent sexist, but my experience is women are better. Even if it's a positive, it's still not equality. I don't blame men for that. I just blame the system. This is Man Enough. everybody. Welcome back to Man Enough. I am Jamie Heath, and we've got... Who do we have here? Who are you? I'm Christopher <laughs> Reva. Oh, you're not Justin. I'm not Justin. <laughs> I'm not Justin. I don't have that beard. I need to work on that. But amazing hair, just uh, like Justin. Tight. Just like... So I'm wait, feeling well, at you? ease. I am Liz Plank. Liz yes. Plank. And yes. we are here back doing an episode for everybody and for ourselves, and we have a guest host. Justin Baldoni is in the middle of prepping for a next movie, so we're missing him, but he's here in spirit. He just called us in, so he sends his love. But we have an amazing person sitting in that chair. I'm happy to be here, me and my curls. Christopher Rivas. (laughs) Christopher Rivas. And you do a podcast of your own called Brown Enough. I do a podcast called Brown Enough. We're in the enough world together, (laughs) all of us. Uh, And I'm so grateful to be here with this team and to have these beautiful conversations and uh, to bring my my energy and, yeah, to embody this chair. Mm. Well, we are thrilled that you're here joining us. I know, Liz, you feel the same way. When we had you on our show... um, you moved us very much um, because of the depth of thought, the way that you also share it. You have this calmness about you that I think invites people in to hear your thoughts. And you care about these subjects a lot. You care about humanity and you care about boys and, of course, girls and what we can do better to include all people and and um, further along society to bring forth an ever advancing civilization, which is really our purpose, right? So we are thrilled that we will be able to glean from your thoughts and your ideas and your spirit. Wow. I'm going to receive that and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to honor it. I'm going to honor it and we're going to do this together and it's going to be a beautiful salsa bachata man enough dance. Oh, I love it. And before we, we bring our guest on, Liz, I just have a question for you that maybe you might share with our audience. Um, every time I see you, every time <laughs> I, I run into you, you're on the street. <laughs> Some episodes like has been on the street. I'm in New York. I run into you in the street. Do you have a house? I do. Are you I, sure? Yeah. I, I don't spend a lot of time there. I'm always on the go. I'm on the go a lot. Uh-huh. And I and I actually focus better when I'm moving. I feel <laughs> overstimulated most of the time. And so if I'm out and I'm doing movement, then I don't feel as overstimulated. I see. So yeah. that's why I keep running into you in the street. Yeah. I'm in the streets. I'm in when we're doing I'm our, our, our prep. I'm in the streets. All right. I'm just like <laughs> when we're doing our Zoom calls, I'm often walking. I'm going somewhere i'm coming back from somewhere mm. but hopefully i i do feel like i'm engaged in those you are always of course you are but yes i just do on the you've been at my apartment jamie <laughs> ah that's right of all people actually no one you're the only person who's been to my apartment <laughs> and we did a prank on justin we in my did, apartment indeed. once when we did a live. well good all right who do we have today we have someone we're very, very excited to have on the show. He's everywhere right now. A lot of people are trying to get him. And so we're really, really excited to uh, be able to spend time with him. Richard V. Reeves. He mm. is a senior fellow in economic studies at the Brookings Institution, where he directs the Boys and Men Project, which we love. He is the author of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Struggling, Why It Matters, and What to Do About It. Mm. He's also a regular contributor to the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and the Atlantic. Richard uh, Reeves, thank you so much for being with us. Hey, thank you for having me on. I'm really looking forward to this. Hey. You've been in a whirlwind. You've been uh, you've been everywhere. <laughs> it, has it been, have you been surprised by how popular the topic of masculinity is um, in 2023? No, well, I think, I think you of all people having written about this, Liz, know that there's <laughs> always a market for discussions <laughs> about masculinity, boys and men. 
I think what I've been pleasantly surprised by is the range of interest. So mm. part of my goal was to try and help create a safer space to talk about these issues with people who would certainly wouldn't consider themselves to be conservatives, mm. you know, center left or, or whatever. And certainly people who are strongly committed to women's rights mm. uh, and to the problems of girls and women. So how, you know, could we think two thoughts at once? Could mm-hmm. we, mm. could we have this conversation at the same time? So I've been really, really pleasantly surprised by that. And, and even when people are disagreeing, I think this, you do this on the show all the time to try and make that disagreement a constructive yeah. one where we're learning from each other. Mm. I have a question for you because you are so deep in this work and you have so much to say. I'm also curious, I'm one personally that that enjoys hearing things from people if I know them a little bit, right? Um, otherwise, it's like, you know, it's just for me, it's opening up a book and I'm just listening to different scholars and I have no connection to them. And I feel like a lot of people might function that way. So would you mind sharing whatever you're comfortable with, a little bit about who you are, like why you care about this space, maybe a little bit about your childhood, um, what framed you, um, just a little bit so we can know who you are outside of your work. Yeah, thank you. And I agree. Uh, I think that all scholarship is at least partly autobiographical. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's just a question, really, of you know, do we admit that to ourselves? Right? It's, it's not a coincidence why we're drawn to certain certain subjects. And so, for me, first of all, you probably, in case you can't tell by now, I'm I'm from the UK originally, moved to the US. I have an American wife and Anglo American kids, and I've. Re- raised three boys now all in their 20s on both sides of the pond and so part of this has been seeing the world through their eyes and some of the the new challenges and opportunities that they've had my own father had a huge impact on me so my parents were of the generation where the division of labor was pretty clear but also a very strong equality between them but my my dad's role as the provider and as the person that kind of really felt that economic pressure was huge. And he became unemployed a couple of times, once for really a long time. And every day he would still get up and he would shave and shower and he'd put on like a shirt and go into the, like the spare room to just type out resumes to try and get a job. And I asked him at breakfast one day, I said, Dad, why why are you still showering and shaving? No one can see you. You don't have a job now. And he said, yes, I do. I have a job to get another job so that I can take care of you. Mm. And that was obviously a very traditional way of, of seeing his role. But it, but it was also, for me, just that sense of responsibility that he and my mom in very different ways took for our well-being and the care and the love that was just taken for granted through my childhood has been huge to me. And it's made me think a lot about how I am as a father, how I am as a husband, a brother, a a man. But I think that example I had from my father has has been huge for me. And then being a father myself has really influenced my own journey. And then, you know, how to make marriage work in this kind of modern, modern world has been a real a challenge, I think to quote Justin, a beautiful challenge. Marriage is a beautiful challenge, but mm-hmm. a challenge nonetheless, and, and one that hasn't always come easily for me. And I think partly because of this question about how to be a man today and what does it mean to succeed as a man mm. today. You, uh, thank you for sharing that. That that helps me a lot. See, already now I'm like, oh, okay, that's Richard, right? Um, <laughs> not necessarily what he speaks about, but like there he is right there. You had said marriage, of course, can be challenging, beautifully, wonderfully challenging. What might you share that has that you have learned um, that has been challenging? What steps have you taken to be better or um, to learn the steps so that it's less challenging? Well, if we're going to go really, really personal, really fast. That's what we do yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. It's like, all right, here I am. There was, so my wife and I were in couples therapy. This is 10 years ago now. And she said something that was a pivotal point for me. She said, I'd been talking about, you know, what a great husband I was, how I'd shared raising the kids, which I had, and how we shared everything. And and she's looked me in the eye in this session and she said, you seem to think the problem is that you're not feminist enough. Mm. That's not the problem. You've always been feminist enough. The problem is that you're not masculine enough. Mm. So that's a moment. That's definitely a moment (laughs) in a relationship. And it turned out to be the moment of growth. It turned out to be the moment of of reckoning in some ways and of of realization for me that I'd got it wrong, 
that I had thought that in order to be like a good partner and a good feminist and a good ally and good husband in the modern world, I somehow had to shrink myself. I had to become less. Mm. I had to become less for her to be more. And in some ways, I ended up seeing my own masculinity, and we can obviously get into what we mean by that. And Liz has obviously written a lot about this too, as a problem, something to be shrunk, something to be reduced, something to be expunged, something that was to be gotten out of the way. And what she meant by that, I think, was that I actually just wasn't calling out my own needs enough. I was being too passive. I wasn't engaging with her as an equal. I actually, I was actually retreating. And I think that's part of a broader societal challenge is that we want, we need to rise together. We don't need one sex to become less for the other to become more. Mm. Mm. So was writing this book, I think when we write any book, I've only written one book, so I'm not an expert. Uh, when we write any book, whether it is intellectually based, research based, emotional based, there is some healing in it. Did you write this mm -hmm. book to do some healing? Yeah, I would never ad admit that on the face of the book, of course. But to the extent that they're all autobiographical, I, what's between the lines of the book? This is not in the lines of the book. But because the book's quite a sort of wonky social science. I'm a social scientist, right? It's charts and you know policies and, and stuff. And I think that's hugely important to get those discussions out there. But between the lines... You guys have already got me like we're not having conversation. About the, the, we're having a conversation about the book within the book now mm -hmm. and the person <laughs> within the public person. So mm -hmm. right, we're only a few minutes in. I don't know how we're going to sustain this, but <laughs> Thank I, you. Um, I, I think it. it was. We can't keep going deeper. Um, <laughs> I didn't show up to not go deep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's consent. Also, we, you don't have to answer questions you're not comfortable to. We, we have to also be, I mean, oh. be clear about don't, that. Yeah. We don't, don't want to feel don't, invasive, don't, don't, but we want to get to know you. Don't, yes. know. don't worry. I know you're. I know. I know you're recording this to publish. publish <laughs> and I, I also. I also think that. So back to the Christopher's point about healing, but also the personal aspect to this. I, I think kind of blurring the line between the personal and the public, between the intellectual and the emotional, between the head and the heart, if you like, is actually part of the work here. And what I've discovered is that, and we're discovering it even a little bit now, is that even as we're having these conversations about the charts on higher education or the evidence on whatever it is, that this is a heart project as well as a head project. This is, this is about how we look at each other, how we see each other. Mm -hmm. And that's not only inescapable, it's, it's actually a good thing. Mm -hmm. And that's been a real struggle for me, even since the book has come out. I've been invited into more conversations about culture, about emotion, and that's uncomfortable, right? My professional persona is very much one of like, abstract intellectual life. I'm a Brookings Institution scholar, for goodness sake. Like that's the currency mm. uh, of my world. But I actually think that's part of the problem that actually we're not doing a very good job of integrating those different aspects of ourselves. Mm. That's I, the healing. Yeah. Integration. Yes, I mean, thank you so much for sharing that. It seems like what happened with you inside your marriage and, again, is happening within marriages across America and across many other countries and, and even in, you know, personal relationships outside of marriage is that we've kind of misunderstood the goal and the mission of feminism, which the goal of feminism and gender equality was not to be better than men, was not to supersede men, right? It was never to, it, it, you know, compete or to dominate. It was actually, you know, the goal of equality and, and truly feminist scholarship, if you go back to the, you know, the roots of it, which is mostly black women like Audre Lorde and Bell Hooks, right? Like what they're talking about is creating a whole new system that goes outside of that male versus female and sometimes I feel like in some of these conversations that we're having around masculinity, which I'm so happy that we're, you know, having more of them, is still that we're locked in that dynamic, in that framing. You know, there's a New Yorker piece um, that was an interview with you, and the image was, you know, a young girl jumping <laughs> over a young boy who was yeah. kind of cradled and sad. And I just thought that symbolizes this idea that that somehow the empowerment of girls ha comes has to come off the backs of boys. And I think in a previous version right. of feminism, it was 
or or a distorted view of feminism is well the it, yeah we you know you need to be smaller and you need, you need to shut up so that I can take up more space and I can speak but it's actually about like everyone being fully themselves everyone taking up all of the space creating more space realizing like we've actually been boxed in and there's you know you talk about space and your work like reinventing the system to me is really what w- we should be talking about and I feel like in some of the ways that you're being interviewed. And and again, I I think it's the the framing of the questions. They're kind of like, come on, admit it. You know, girls are doing way better than 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 boys. And, you know, we should be they're they're kind of almost like pigeonholing you in in, into admitting that. And I and and that's what makes me deeply uncomfortable. I'm sorry, this is a very long (laughs) I've had a lot of imaginary conversations with you. And so now we're having a real one. I'm just curious if you could speak to that, right? That is there a way that we can talk about this conversation that goes outside of this individualist, rugged, you know, uh, c- competitive nature, which honestly comes from the patriarchy, right? It, it is at the root of what's hurting men and boys and has been hurting women and girls as well. Yeah, well, I'm so glad you are settled. So this is great. Um, I Actually, there was a word that Christopher used in your conversation uh, with him. We talked about being uncontained. Mm. And actually, kind of, you know, paused and just kind of wrote that totally. down because I think this idea of like con- being like being contained. Um, so I, I agree that part of the problem here is, and I, I think this is a problem on like both sides. If I can even use the dualism, is of this idea of zero sum. Yeah, right? is I think I think that zero sum thinking, the idea that for group A to gain, B group B has to lose, is poisoning our politics our culture and our society. Zero sum thinking is the enemy, right? Mm. Uh, And it's not to suggest that there aren't areas where there are trade-offs and so on, but nonetheless to make it zero sum. And I do think that that's what's happened at a kind of intellectual level with a lot of this. But as I shared earlier, I think the danger is it can happen at a bit of a personal level too, which is like, I have to lean out for you to be able to lean in. I have to be less for you to be more. I have to take up less space for you to take up more space rather than saying, no, 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 let's, let's rise and flourish together mm-hmm. as equals the difficulty i think comes and this may be an area of disagreement between us is that part of the journey for me has actually been to move away from a view that this that gender is socialized entirely you know, almost entirely right. socialized and that the future is androgynous that to be uncontained we have to be androgynous and more to a recognition that on average and with overlapping distributions there are some real differences Mm-hmm. in preferences and psychology that, that, that distinguish the masculine and the feminine. And that's okay. It's not that one's better than the other. Mm-hmm. And we have to find a way to kind of live well together. And that's, I think, been a journey for me. And I think that may be a point of, of interesting difference between us. Certainly, Liz, based on my no- knowledge of your work, between us. But I do agree. I mean, that New Yorker picture was, it was a nicely drawn picture that went with the, <laughs> right. went with the review. But I agree that it was classically zero-sum framing, yeah. like Supergirl, yeah. crushing Superman, basically. Right. right. I agree with that. But I am curious about that biological perspective because yeah. I remember in, in an interview with Scott Galloway, you know, you kind of said you chopped off like an entire chapter, <laughs> basically all, all about that. And so I'm, I'm curious if you want to share any of those hot <laughs> topics that were not, um, were, were too hot to be published that, that you could share here. Yeah. Well, I can, but so, so, so now, first of all, we've talked about the book within the book, then the man within the man. Now we're going to talk about the chapters that are not in the book, which is great. I think it's a <laughs> great conversation already. Oftentimes that's where the juice is. <laughs> right. Like, you want the stuff. So I did say to him, like, there was a chapter that was on sex specifically, like a draft chapter sex and romance and dating and so on. And that did not go in the book. And that's for a number of reasons. One is that I didn't feel I knew enough yet. Secondly, I didn't have any particular policy prescriptions around it. And I wanted to be quite policy wonky. But thirdly, you know, my um, my friend and agent said to me, if you have a chapter in this book on sex, nobody is going to ask you to say more about your ideas for technical high schools. <laughs> <laughs> and as it turns out, not many people have asked me about my ideas for technical high schools anyway. I've definitely answered more <laughs> questions on Tinder than I have on technical high schools, even though the chapter is not in the book. But I do have a chapter on the differences between men and women and the, the extent to which they are rooted in, in biology. And then, of course, influenced by culture. And the thing that frustrates me, and I know you've talked quite a lot about this on the show, about the sort of na- the nature versus culture distinction, is the view that that's zero sum rather than co-evolving. And I think this is closer to your view, Liz. 
actually, for me, the fact that there are some biologically rooted differences between men and women on average around, for example, risk taking, potential for aggression. I'm using my words quite closely here, a bit more driven in terms of sexuality. The fact that there are those differences doesn't make culture less important makes mm -hmm. culture more important because culture is the way we learn how to express and not express those differences, how we bring those differences together in a kind of creative and beautiful way. And so not only is it falsely put as a zero sum game, actually the acknowledgement of biological differences makes the cultural framework within which they're expressed or not expressed, valorized or not valorized, more important, not less right. important. But I think they're real. I don't think gender is entirely socialized. I think it's yeah. partly And I agree with you. I do. Yeah. Seeing as the name of this show is Man Enough, mm -hmm. if I'm quoting you correctly, 10 years ago, your wife said, the problem is you're not masculine enough. Are you masculine? Do we have enough? to keep? Do we have to? Do we have to keep using <laughs> that like throughout the show? Now? That that the whole time we're going to use that one. <laughs> I'm focused on the enough. That's the name is of this the episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Way. It is. It is. That's the name so, of the episode. All right. Yeah. Fine. fine. <laughs> I think are it's you, fantastic that you shared that, so thank I you. Do, I do. Really, a lot I of do. men, I think it's yeah. so common. Well, I guess my question is, are you masculine enough yes. now? What does that mean? Mm. Well, I think what it means is that I have, I've, st I've stopped seeing the aspects of my personality and my psychology that I think are more you know, typically seen as masculine as, as a problem. And instead, just to be kind of more comfortable in my own skin. I mean, I think one of the, the, one of the, the things about the recent movements around gender equality and gender fluidity and so on has been about being comfortable in your own skin. And right. we, shouldn't, we shouldn't leave men out that conversation, mm -hmm. right? Uh, even if they're cisgender, heterosexual men, right? Mm -hmm. They still have kind of many of the same you know, thought processes and needs and so on. So look, here's an example, right? I'm still more status conscious, perhaps, than I should mm -hmm. be. There are definitely differences around attitudes towards sex within a lot of relationships. Esther Perel said, the challenge we face now, I think it was Esther Perel, but I may be, mis may be misquoting something, saying, how do, you, how do you make equality erotic? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And I think that's really true is like how, because there are still differences in the way we relate to each other sexually. And so just becoming more comfortable with all of that in my own relationships and in my own life, just kind of being OK with, with, with those as aspects of myself rather than taking on some of the senses that there's something pathological about it. Again, this is a potentially a point of difference, at least between Liz and I, which is that I don't like the term toxic masculinity. Mm hmm. Because I think it just gets too close to the mm -hmm. idea that masculinity itself is a bit mm -hmm. toxic. And because well, it's yeah. very hard in practice, for, right? How do you, I've yet to find anybody who can successfully define non toxic masculinity mm -hmm. in a way that is distinct from femininity. And I think if you can't do that, then it's an, em it's an empty concept. Yeah. Well, we, we, we don't say that word here either. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. We don't like that and, word either. And I took it out of my book and I, we, we are with you on that. I, I, you know, I love some of right. the things you're saying. So I have four children, two boys, two girls. Um, I am one that believes that we have conflated equality with sameness, that we think equality mm -hmm. oftentimes equals being the same. And in fact, true equality to me is that two different things are seen as equal and treated equally, but not they're not equal because they are the same. I do believe that boys and girls, women and men, inherently have differences. Because one has been seen as being better than the other, then we make this one something to covet versus the other. And I think that's where the problem is, but not rather to say that women are supposed to be like men, because this is what the narrative was a lot when my kids were younger. You have to raise your daughter to be more this, to be more like, essentially, to be more like mm. men. And I was like, wait a minute. So in, for her to be seen as equal, she has to be more like right. a man. That's not right. That doesn't feel yeah. good. Right. Um, my daughter yeah. has amazing qualities inherent to her that should be celebrated and championed equally as that of my son. And I think the twistedness is that we are celebrating my son more than her. And she's forced to think that what comes with her is not enough. And therefore, we're saying you have to be more like men. There are differences uh, I see that my son has more testosterone than my my daughter. We know that testosterone has an effect on our biology. We know mm. that boys have more of it than girls, just biologically. So they're more, um, I don't know, whatever comes with that, just running around crazy, jumping off the walls, not staying still in classrooms, things of that nature because of this energy that oftentimes yeah. is different than that of my daughter.
more risk taking, etc. But but like I think part of the challenge here is not it's a difficult balance given how you know given that we've had I don't know let's say conservatively ten thousand years where gender equality was the cause of women and girls, and we've seen such such rapid change re- recently. It's hard almost to say this, but we do have to be careful not to go too far the other way. Mm-hmm. And I think I've heard you say, Jamie, I think it's in the intro to this show, is like, you think women are better. <laughs> well, and there is this I, future, is fe- future is female. Uh, this actually, it's actually well established in the literature now. This is kind of, it's called the wow effect, the women are wonderful effect. And interestingly, people are much more open to the idea of a discussion of biological differences mm-hmm. if they're framed in a way that makes women seem superior to men. Mm-hmm. And I actually think that's not the right path. I think that the, I understand why people are doing that, but I don't think it's the right. The right path has got to be has got to be what you just said, which is: look, there are differences again on average, but not one isn't necessarily better than the other. It depends how and when it's expressed, right? Sure. Like the risk taking difference. If it's true, the boys and men, and this is quite a big difference, are more likely to take risks. Is that a good mm-hmm. or a bad thing? The answer: yes. It's a bad thing when they're young men. In fact, one of the scariest sentences to come out of a young man's mouth is, here, hold my drink and watch this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? There's a bad aspect to risk-taking. You all know what I mean? But on the other hand, it is also true that when it comes to kind of taking the risk to save the life of a stranger, that tends to be a more male thing too. So mm-hmm. good or bad? Answer, yes. Depends on how and when it's expressed. But I, I would challenge you, Jamie, on the idea that women are intrinsically better than men or the other way around. Well, let me just say something because I think this is always going to be a theme with me. I do not believe that women are intrinsically better than men. I've tried to make that more clear as time goes on. But I do believe that women Mm. right now are doing it better than men. That's a different Mm. statement for me. I I do believe Mm. that throughout humanity right now, if you train certain people to uh, like whatever, like two athletes, and you give athletes – eat this way, f- eat this food, train in this capacity. And you have another athlete that trains in a different way. At the end, you might look and then say, well, this athlete is actually more in tune because they trained in this way. Mm. So I believe that inherently we are equal 100%. Yeah. One is not better. But I do see throughout the world that women are get, are doing it better, advancing humanity in a better capacity, if it's not for any of the reasons because they talk more than men do. So in, when you talk and have therapy, you inherently you then become a better person mm-hmm. because you're bouncing your ideas off another person. Men don't do it as much. If you are part of that group of people that talk, you, I believe, are going to be a better human. Mm-hmm. So that's why I say mm-hmm. women, not that they're better than men, and I should rephrase how I say it, but I believe that women are doing it better right now than men are. That's that's really where I stand. Yeah, it's a difference in skill level, not in innate ability level. Correct. Basically. Yeah, that's, that's, and, and by yeah. the way, I always push back when Jamie says that. That's one of our biggest arguments is yeah. that I, I think even that sets up like your women are better. It's still like, again, I, I just not don't. Not women are better, women are doing better. Women are doing better. And you've said this even, we, we've had this conversation around race where you're like, like forgiveness, I think, right? Like. I believe that, that too. Right? But it's it's not fair that you've had to be better. It is and not it's fair, not fair that you've been in an environment. But the fact is, yeah. people of color have had to right. practice the act of forgiving more than yes. people that are white. Yes. On a daily basis. On yes. a daily basis. <laughs> All so the if time. you yes. practice it, you might right now. Now, it's unfair that we've had to. Mm-hmm. It's unfair that women have had to develop skills that men didn't. 100%. Mm-hmm. I live in a country that we know that I live in. And I embrace white people and I embrace the religion that was given to us when we became slaves. And you can't do that without compassion and forgiveness. We've had to practice it. So we've developed these skills. And I think that women have, I I think that's an acknowledgement more than it is um, anything else. But I hear the Mm -hmm. point and I understand where it's a slippery thing, but it doesn't change my perspective that at the end of the day, regardless of the reason why. Yeah. Women are doing it better. Yeah. Well, th- this actually bleeds into, uh, you know, another question, which is when you talk about gender inequality in schools and in colleges, right? So we're starting from a position of like 50 years ago, not just that women were discouraged from going to college, like women weren't even allowed, right, to go to certain mm. colleges. You know, you have an interview with Bill Maher where he literally talks about going to college where there were no women. Um, and so mm-hmm. now... And, and and this is what bugged me in the in the language that you used in that moment in another interview. You know, you said now the you you're, you're still using gender inequality to define 
the phenomenon of, of, of there being more women in colleges than men. And I don't think that that's the, to me, using gender inequality in that context is like if there were more black women who are getting degrees than white women, would that be racial inequality? No. Right. Like black women have had to get to a point where they've had to work so hard in order to get degrees in a, in a society that has tried to prevent them from doing it or makes it harder for them to do it. If they are overachieving, is that like we, we wouldn't call, is what I'm saying making sense? Like we wouldn't call that racial inequality <laughs> yeah. if people of color were, you know, doing better in school than white people. We would still talk about it like there's something going on. But I think using the term gender inequality in that context, when it's not that there's laws trying to get men out of schools or an entire society that's, you know, devoted to trying to, you know, uh, push them out. Mm. And so can we is there another language that we should be using that acknowledges that this isn't like a structural, you know, discrimination that's happening? Yeah, well, you're getting into the why of the gap. So the data are pretty clear. The, the, so just to put the data point on the table, in 1972, when Title IX was passed, men were about 13 percentage points more likely to get a college degree than women. Now women are about 15 percentage points more likely than men to get a college mm -hmm. degree, right? So I'll use the language for now in the way that you've just criticized and then defend it. So there's a bigger gender inequality in higher education in the US today than there was in 1972. It's just the other way around. Now, I think that I'm just using gender inequality in a neutral sense there to describe any gap that can be, that can be seen between the mm. two genders. So you could get it in life expectancy, for example. But here's another example, the gender pay gap. Do we still want to measure the gender pay gap? And I think the gender pay gap is, is neutral. I don't think that the fact of the gender pay gap is in dispute. In fact, it's not in dispute, it's a fact. The question is, like, why is it happening? And the real argument is, is it because of gender discrimination and patriarchy, or is it because of something else, occupational choice, child rearing, whatever? But I don't think the fact of describing a gender inequality in wages is anything other than a fact. And I would say the same about a gender inequality in education. And just because it goes the other way doesn't make it less true, right? Well, but would you use racial, would you call it racial inequality? If it if, if we were talking about race, would you choose that terminology? Because I think there is a difference between gender gap and gender inequality, right? Like that gender inequality, and again, this is to me, uh, but that that connotes sexism, hmm. right? That connotes a societal discrimination. And and it, and and yeah, women being barred from being going to college in 1972 is dif is is different from men being you know having difficulties though they're admitted in in colleges. And again, I'm saying it's good that we're acknowledging that issue, but to use the same term mm. to describe women not being allowed to go to college and men not doing as well in college to me is is a false equivalency, and it kind of obfuscates the way that for women, this was, you know, a, the, you know, this was the state doing this. This was the government doing this and preventing them from being. Can I just know, add something? And, yeah. and Chris, I know okay. you, you know what, you have some yeah. thoughts. I know for sure. I heard both points really well because, uh, uh, first of all, Liz, what you had said, I think it's something that I've had to learn mm -hmm. throughout life. And, um, Richard, what you are saying, the fact of what you just said made complete sense to me. And I don't argue any point you just said. Here's just the facts. And you're using a term to describe the facts. And I have no problem with that in a vacuum. But yet, when I hear you say that we're using terms that are also likened to something else, it then frames it in a way that we then cannot see it yeah. for just the facts. So we have to be careful and mindful of the terms that we use, even though they you might be able to stand behind them just in the factual realm. They have other ramifications to it. And, it. and it frames our mind to think about it in a certain way. And you're wanting us to be mindful of how we use those terms. You're not arguing the data itself. No, yeah. The fact of there is gender inequality uh, in that. But the word inequality. Gender inequality, yeah, that means brings up something. A, it means yeah. something. And yeah. then therefore you automatically think that men are being oppressed. Right. And and I think th that's exactly right. And I and I think that we come up with better solutions when we're able to really use the right language to label the problem. And and this is the fear mm. that I have, where people are hearing you know gender inequality now, and it's like, well, now men are the ones who are oppressed, and and, and right, sort of equi it, 
doing equivocation with the way that women were, you know, prevented from being in college is right. different from what's going on. There, there, there are two problems that are worthy of being addressed e- equally, but the the source of the problem is different. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, and I'd love. I actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna say something. I'd love to get Christopher's view on because um, I think we're, I think to some extent we're having an argument about terminology, but an important one. The way I hear this is that I'm using the word inequality the way you're using the word gap, which is just as a right. just a, a neutral statement about this is an inequality, whether it's in pay or life expectancy or like I would say there was a gender in a, a gender inequality in COVID deaths. Right, men were much more likely to die of COVID. Yeah. I think you you don't like that because you'd impl- that implies that there was some sort of structural reason for it. For you, inequality is carrying some moral weight as a word. And for me, it's not. Which is fair. Yeah, I mean, it's like, you're talking somewhat like, I, I do a lot of work on income inequality, Yeah. for example, right? So you measure income inequality, and that's just like a measure, right? Uh, mm-hmm. And I think what you're, what you're pointing to is that the why it's happening is important. Yes. But take the, take race as an example. This is where I think Christopher will be, be really useful. So I've done quite a lot on, on racial inequality as well. And I would use the term racial inequality to describe the gap between white and Hispanic or Latino kids in school, for example, and between, say, white and black. But if there are differences, they are for very different reasons. I mean, mm-hmm. arguably, like such different reasons, right? Or the wealth gap, for example. I mean, the, the, the reason why there's a difference in wealth levels between white and Hispanic or Latino households and between white and black households, completely different, like different mm-hmm. categories altogether. But I'd still use the term racial inequality to describe the two. And I'm not sure I should now, given the conversation we just had, but I'd, I'd love to know what Crystal thinks of that. Please. I think everything under whiteness, I mean, here's my whole, I gotta go back to like, to facts and numbers, right? Fifteen uh, percent of women are getting into college more, or getting a college education over men. Yes, that's what mm-hmm. you said. F- fifteen percentage point gap. Yeah. Fifteen percentage point gap. How do bodies of culture, everyone under whiteness, black, brown, how do those people fall into these studies? Mm. Who college sometimes isn't even on their mind because the system doesn't even allow them to get that far. Well, okay. So what you're going to do now is release the inner social scientist in me. Right? So you, you've, you've done, good. We've, we've, we've done this unleash. the wrong way around. Like normal, normally, I have to go through like lots of social science stuff, and then maybe we get personal at the end, right? This is like we've gone deeply personal, <laughs> and I get social sciencey about it. Um, I mean, as a, as someone that studies something like racial inequality, uh, gender inequality, class inequality in education, employment. The reason why I think it's important to, to look at the, the data patterns, but then try and look beyond them and say, why? What's, what's driving that gap? I'm going to try and use Liz's language for now. Um, what's, what's behind that? What lies behind that gap is really important. We shouldn't assume to know what lies behind a gap. So I'll give you one really specific example. There was a very nice study looking at the gap in the chances of Uh, Hispanic or Latino kids going away to a a selective college versus white kids from the same areas in Texas. And all of the gap was explained statistically by the fact that the Hispanic kids said they wanted to stay near their families and the white kids didn't. So there wasn't discrimination on the part of the institutions. They were getting the same, they were getting good. This is controlling for test scores and everything else. And so what's happening was that the Hispanic and Latino kids were saying, I don't want to go that far away from home. And the white kids were saying, I'm happy to go that far away from home. Whereas the reason the black kids weren't going was for very different reasons. It's because they weren't getting served by the high schools as well. There were bigger financial obstacles. And so the reason I'm raising that as a very sort of nerdy sounding example is I think as a policymaker, it's really important to understand what's driving a gap if we are to have any chance of reducing it. And Mm -hmm. the drivers of gaps vary differently by different groups, by race, gender, class, geography, et cetera. Well said. (laughs) I... I, um... I want us to keep moving forward, but I just have to just say one thing because I think this is really important for me. I am captivated, honestly, by the way you express yourself. I think you have a lot of amazing data. You've clearly done the work. And you are, you're, you're, what I've noticed what you do is you speak, but you speak in bite size. Like you're not just going on in a whole dissertation that no one else gets in, which is great for people who do that. But I appreciate when there's conversations. So you'll say something and then you leave space for someone else. And I think that you invite people to have conversations. So well done. Thank you for doing what you do. In the work that you do in all of us, we want people to hear us, right? We don't want to just say things. The goal is to go into a room 
and have them hear our thoughts and embrace them, whether they agree or not, but at least consider them. And if we start with language that sometimes puts up a wall for someone, then I want to change that language because I want them to hear my message and not get caught up in the language. I know I can use this word inequality to say that um, there was inequality in baseball with whites and blacks because blacks were left out of sports. Specifically, they were oppressed. You cannot Mm -hmm. come in here. You can't do it. There was an inequality, and we use that term. You could also use the term inequality in, in basketball now, black and white. There's not a lot of white people in it. But if you use the term, if I use the term there's inequality in basketball, in race, or a white person said that, black people are going to be like, what do you mean yeah. there's inequality? Well, black people go wild. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean inequality? <laughs> because white people are not, are not being told they can't come in it because of their race. They're not being oppressed. Yeah. The reason is, as you had said, there's a reason for it. But that word inequality mm-hmm. elicits so much. It's in our blood. It's in our marrow. Like so much but, has been unequal for yeah. so long. So much oppression yeah. has taken place towards women, right. towards bodies of culture that as soon as the oppressed, you know, or the oppressor says there's inequality yeah. now, it's like, well, watch it. What? Watch yeah. it. I think it's important to use, if I want to make the point to someone to hear it, it is important to the terms that we use so that it can then be heard. And I would be like, oh, don't use the word inequality when we're talking about the basketball makeup. I would be like, there's a gap between black and white people or there, there is a disparity in races in it. Um, it doesn't then elicit emotion that I'm going to now mm-hmm. get defensive over it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I hear that's what mm. Liz, when you say that, there's so much to it. So I think there was a learning I just had in there that we can say the same thing and just yeah. reframe our, our, our words. This is, this is an incredibly good example of like the value of this kind of exchange because mm-hmm. – this is literally a point that has never been made to me before. And I'm sitting here thinking about it and thinking that the I think I'm using the word inequality in a neutral way, right? Like, like gap. But what is heard is that inequality is related in an important way to an injustice. Correct. Right. And so by using the language of inequality, you imply, you infer right. an injustice. Right. And that obviously gets people's backs up if you're suddenly talking about the gender inequality mm-hmm. for boys and men in education, because that's not the result of an injustice. Mm-hmm. Whereas previous gen- inequality, the other way was, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm just kind of, I'm sitting, I, I need to sit with this for a little bit longer, but it's incredibly useful for me just to have heard that, Liz, and and to know that that word inequality is being received differently to the way that I mean it. And that might help me to improve my communication. So I'm really grateful for that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm wow. so happy. I'm so happy. <laughs> um, all right. What else we got? Let, let, let's move I got on. A, I have a bunch. I got a, I a personal uh, <laughs> question. I have a nephew. I thought I thought, I thought we were just going to get into the charts and the data now. <laughs> no, we no, done no. with all the uncomfortable personal no, stuff. No, that's what we, we dip want. We in and right? out. That's what we do. It's, it's you uncomfortable. Keep tri- you're just it's... tricking me into it. You keep yeah, lulling that... me to a false sense of security. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. I have a, a young nephew, um, and he spends a lot of time on social media. And mm. I think it is, from an outsider point of view, I think it's problematic. Like, I think it is, I think he's looking up to the wrong types of people, the people, the men who have the most views or the the, the TikTokers or the person on like Twitch who just plays a video game all day and millions of people watch him play a video game. And like, that's his model for masculinity or for coolness or for success. I, I want to know if social media plays a role in your... I guess I want to return to systems. The system was designed for men. And now you're saying the system is hurting men. What was the thing that entered the system that ruined it? I think it depends which system we're talking about. I mean, we have to be a bit more specific. So I think there are some systems that still work pretty well for men, like the labor market, for example, which still preferences like non-caring parents, for example. Um, The education system, I argue, actually isn't working so well for boys and men now. Um, because of just differences in development and so on too. But but I think that social media is a really great example of the way that it's, it's playing out differently for boys and girls. Um, I think overall the evidence is that social media has been more damaging for girls and young women than it has for boys and young men. I think sure. especially kind of relationally, and you can really see that coming out in, in the work of people like um, you know, Jonathan Haidt, uh, Gene Twenge, and so on. 
That said, I think what social media can do for boys is it just provides somewhere to go when you're trying to find an answer to the question of how to be in the world. And what I see when they end up with someone like Andrew Tate, the kind of, you know, very, very, you know, important influencer who's was deplatformed for misogyny and has now been arrested for alleged trafficking and rape. Why did he get 12 billion TikTok views? Why was he the third most searched person on the internet last year after Donald Trump and Queen Elizabeth? Why was he ranked as the most important influencer in the world by US teens? Mm. And I think the answer is because he is providing an answer to the question of how should I be a man in the world today? How do I go from being a boy to a man? Um, and the question then is like, why are they finding him? And mm. I think it's because we're not doing as a good enough job as we should be as a culture of just confidently showing different ways to have this pro-social masculinity. We've left a gap, we've left a vacuum, partly because we're worried about these categories altogether. We're worried about the idea of masculinity altogether. And we have other we have other things to worry about. But I think that's created a dangerous vacuum into which many, many young men, maybe your nephew, like like mm. so I'm more interested in the demand than the supply, basically. Like why is he why where does he end up when he searches mm -hmm. for that stuff? Um, and the first, the last thing I'll say in it is having some personal experience of this with my own boys, we shouldn't shame them mm. if they're looking at content that is misogynist or distasteful or has elements of that in it. But we should say, well, how, why is that appealing to you? What's interesting about that to you? What What is that doing for you? And then have a constructive conversation about it rather than just having the kind of immediate horror that they would be looking at it. Like sit down, that's what I've certainly done, is sit down and say, what do you like about this? What's good about it? What's bad about it? Let's talk about that. Let's use it as an opportunity for a conversation about masculinity, which I think is a conversation present company accepted that we're not having enough of. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I love that. And and I that is my favorite thing about you and what you talk about, which is you very clearly named the problem, which is, there, you know, we we have a new definition of what it means to be a woman, and and that def, you know, me being a woman is so different from my mom's definition and my grandmother's mm. definition, and will be so different from my daughter if I have one. Uh, and and for men, they're they're just yeah, it's it's like this open space, and it will be filled by the wrong people if you let it. And you brought up Andrew Tate. One of the things that often gets lost in some of these conversations is who benefits. And unless we mm. name who benefits, the people who are listening to Andrew Tate or Andrew Tate Curious are going to blame women and girls, right? So if boys aren't doing well and you see an image in the New Yorker and you're just flipping, you see, yeah. oh, it's because of, of, of women and girls doing well. And I think one of the... Uh, parts of what you you know your book that that is so important is that you you do discuss that the average male wage is lower than it was in in the 1970s and mm -hmm. it's you know women have been doing a little bit better but a lot a lot of the reason why the gender gap is actually smaller is not because women's wages have gone that much up it's that men's wages have actually been stagnant mm -hmm. and who benefits from the fact that male wages are stagnant who benefits from the fact that working class men aren't be, you know able to make ends meet and I think some of the people who are benefiting are Andrew Tate, are, uh, you know, if you want if you want to name names, they'll probably won't come on our podcast, so it's fine. Uh, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, right? Like, there, there are a lot of men who are benefiting. And again, there are women who are benefiting too, but I do think that hmm. we need to be clear about that. And I'll add one more thing, which, and you can prove me, you know, uh, tell me if you disagree based on the data that you have, but men tend to support those policies that are anti-income redistribution. And women tend to support policies that are investing in uh, all kinds of social support and education changes so that we're paying teachers more so that men can enter that profession. You know, the reason why we have so many, so, mm. so little male teachers is because we devalue women's work <laughs> and teaching is seen as a female profession. And so, and that is, you know, what we're seeing in the data in terms of nursing in terms of teaching, you know, you you talk so much about how we need more men in those professions, but part of the reason why they're not doing it is because those jobs don't pay well. So again, I guess right. I'm coming back to the idea of, 
you know, this is a system, right? And we can come up with different kind of individualist solutions for young boys and men to try and like counter what the system is meant to do. But the system is meant to, you know, benefit a very few amount of men at the top. And then the rest of the men are falling behind because ultimately, yeah, it's kind of, it's like a pyramid scheme, you know? And and so <laughs> does that make sense to you <laughs> that the pyramid, the patriarchy yes. is a pyramid scheme? <laughs> Well, I mean, there, there is an old definition of patriarchy, which you're, I think, which is one you've used, which is it's not men over women. It's a small group of men yes. over everybody else. Yes. And I think that's the version you're referring to. So there's a lot there. I think that the first thing is that I completely agree with you that what's happened is that we've successfully expanded the range of ways to be a woman. Right. We've just, it's been very expansive. Yeah. And I'm not saying that it's job done. There's lots of areas mm -hmm. where there's still a lot more to do for women, right? So just to take the opportunity to say that, that there are many areas where we should do more for women. And in fact, my my uh, wife is trying to raise money right now from venture capital. And so she reminds mm. me on a daily basis that right, between yeah. two and 3% of venture capital money goes to female founders, mm -hmm. right? I, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I'm not allowed to go a day without being reminded of that. And that's, a, I mean, so mm -hmm. just to put that data point, yeah, still huge. lots to do, especially at the apex, right? Mm -hmm. It's at the top where there's still so much more to do. Yeah. So we need to do the same for men. We haven't really had this kind of attractive, more expanded, exciting way, yeah. range of options for being male. Yeah. Um, instead, if something, sometimes it feels like it's become like more constricted, right? In the labor market for the reasons you just discussed, but also just more generally, it's like maleness and masculinity have be has become a more sort of troubled identity. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, a more embattled one economically mm -hmm. and culturally, just as we've done the opposite, I think, for, for women. And that's a huge problem. And one of the examples of that is that whereas we have seen more women going into previously male professions, again, not job done, but when you get to 50% law, 50% medicine, yep. you know, huge gains in recent decades, in the caring professions, the opposite has happened. Yeah. So this is something I've become very passionate about. I want to do more work mm -hmm. on. Psychology, social work, teaching have all plummeted in the male share. The male share of those professions has halved since the 1980s. Wow. They've become female professions. They yeah. didn't used to be. Right. They become the only one, the only exception actually is nursing, where it's ticked up a little bit. And of course, nurses actually do make a pretty good living now. Right. <sighs> so back to your point about pay, which is that. Like K-12 teachers haven't had a pay rise for 20 years mm -hmm. in the U.S. That's a problem Crazy. for all kinds of reasons. And I think it's, it's hugely, it's a big part of the budget item, lots of policy around it. But there's no doubt that that is a factor when it comes to attracting more men into it because everything else equal, men are a little bit more sensitive to salary, at exactly. least for, for now. Mm -hmm. And so actually if it's, if it's high education, relatively low pay, that is a recipe for making right. it hard to get more men into it. Meanwhile, right. fewer and fewer and fewer men in our classrooms, which I think is a social problem mm -hmm. and a cultural problem too. Mm -hmm. Is this an American conversation or are there places around the world that are, that are, their men are, they're, they're masculine and they're, have the soft skills and, you know, everyone's equal. Who's anyone doing it right? Hmm. Good question. <sighs> no, because it's <laughs> incredibly early in a revolution. I mean, the, We've just we've had half a revolution, if at best, in terms of gender, um, uh, and so we're still in the foothills of it. I would say that if you look at places like Scandinavia, it's really struck me, for example, that Norway has just created a commission on boys and men mm. because they're so worried about what's happening to boys and men in Norway. And Norway, of course, is a very gender egalitarian society. There's lots of there's lots of good things for both men and women, fathers and mothers in in that country. But there are enough reasons in some areas like education, mental health, et cetera, to just say, whoa, <laughs> what's happening mm -hmm. here with our boys and men? Um, and so I think everyone is coming to terms with it in different ways. I will say, and this is back to Liz's point about the economy, the the US is a bit of an outlier in just how badly working right. class yeah. men uh, and lower income men have done, right? Partly because of the lack of a safety net and so on. I mean, it, male wages have risen more slowly than female wages, but from a very different base elsewhere. But um, this this class gap yeah. that we've seen opening up, right, it just hugely, and this is my previous work, just over the last few decades, there's this massive gap between like rich and everybody else now. 
And I wouldn't say it's just Jeff Bezos, by the way. I'd say it's me. Yeah. I'd say it's mm-hmm. the top 20%. I'd say it's the yeah. upper middle class. So just pulling mm. And that's yeah. where you've seen massive female wage growth and male wage growth and mm-hmm. higher marriage rates. And so you've just got mm-hmm. this huge fracturing of society. And so one of the problems of this debate is trying to persuade upper middle class people that there are people who are suffering, whether they're men or women, is difficult because if they only hang out with upper, other upper middle class people, yeah. they don't see the suffering. It's literally invisible to them. But that's where mm-hmm. the real suffering is, including many of our working class men. And that's why men are four times more likely to take, take their lives in suicide. Opioid deaths, more than two thirds of the opioid deaths were men. Yeah. And so these deaths of despair, so-called, were predominantly a male phenomenon, but that's because of these this economic fracturing that we've seen, and we just haven't paid enough attention to it, I think. Give me a, a prescription. Oh, he um, has so many. This is a great question. No, I'm so excited. many. How long have I got? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a boy. I mean, I'm 53 mm. years old now, but let's say I'm a young boy me becoming, uh, <laughs> really, becoming a, a man, and I want to get it right. What do you think is a prescription? that can change some of these things. If you held policy in your hand, cultural policy, mm. um, um, all, yes. all of it, right? And you were able to like, here it is, here's my outline, let's follow this, what would you say? Well, I do spend quite a lot of time <laughs> on solutions uh, in the book f- for the reason that I think there has been a lot of discussion of the problems mm-hmm. and not enough discussion of solutions. Sometimes all the, the, some of the discussion about men and boys and masculinity has felt like a secular equivalent of the book of lamentations <laughs> like just lots of woe um yeah. and and not much kind of what to do about it and so i do deliberately try and get into that and some of it relates to the conversations we've just been having so i i think that we do we do need to restructure our education system in ways that make that make it work a bit better for our boys and men now and i think that means more male teachers which we've already discussed i think it means more vocational learning which everything else equal seems to be a little bit more male friendly again everything on average I've also suggested that because boys do develop later than girls, um, just in terms of their their brains, that maybe starting them in school a year later would be good, at least for some of them, that would be a good thing to do. I've already, we've mentioned a bit uh, in the conversation I just had with Liz about, I, I, I want a massive effort to get more boys and men interested in what I call these heel professions, health, education, administration, literacy. I think that the emptying out of men from these professions is scandalous. Mm -hmm. Um, psychology being a great example, right? So we talked about the mental health problems that boys and men are both having, but it's harder and harder to get a male psychologist. I was glad to have a male therapist when I needed one. I was glad my son was able to get a male therapist when he needed one. But the share of men in psychology has dropped from half to 39% to 29%. And among psychologists under the age of 30, only 5% are male. So we're, we're, we're just emptying psychology out of men and we've got to have scholarships and subsidies and programs in high schools and middle schools to make boys and men feel like these are jobs for them. Try finding a therapist who's a man of color. Mm. Yeah. That's right. That's where there is more effort. I mean, there's a little bit more effort there, and especially around teaching and so on, too. So that's a big part of it, for sure. But get, getting like one of the great mantras of the women's movement was you can't be it if you can't see it. So we hit these vicious circles where there aren't men in these professions. It makes it harder to persuade a, you know, a high school boy to think about a career in teaching or nursing or whatever when he doesn't see any men in those roles. And so I really worry about that. And then the last thing I'll say is the importance of fathers. I think mm. one of the big losses from the way that this is framed in the current culture war is that there's a tendency for conservatives to say, of course, fathers matter. That's why they should be married. And they should be husbands and fathers and providers. So they're saying, be more like your dad. And there's a tendency on the left to say, I'm not sure we need fathers anymore. That's a bit heteronormative. Actually, maybe maybe we don't need men. Maybe we can bench all the men. They're, or if they are going to have men, they have to be exactly like the women. Back to where we were remote. So they're saying, be more like your sister or be more like your wife. And in the middle are all the actual men trying to figure this out and trying to be good dads. And we, we we treat unmarried fathers in particular quite badly in the US and more generally. Uh, and so I think changes to the, to the law are huge. And then the last thing I'll say is paid leave for yeah. both mothers and fathers. Mm. I describe it in the book, I think, as wildly utopian, which is six months of paid leave for both mothers and fathers, each of them independently. Mm. So we send the messages that are important. It's a bit less wildly utopian now because guess what? Just last month, the US military, three months for each parent 
the birth parent and the non-birth parent, mostly fathers, three months paid leave. So what does the US military know that we don't? Mm. Why don't mm. civilians get that? Right. And so this idea of fatherhood being an equally important role in life, I just think that I, I really want to bet heavily on fatherhood as well. It, as a father myself and having been fathered, just we're in real danger of benching too many of our dads because they fall between the two stools of current way the debate is framed on the left and the right. But the evidence is clear that dads matter, period. Mm. Can we talk about the definition of success? I think when we think about Andrew Tate's Donald Trump's, you know, uh, maybe even you, right? You're successful. And so we want to be this. We want to be out loud. We want to be vocal. We want to be big. We want to have a lot of followers. How do you redefine success to say, no, success is also being in the healing arts? Yeah. Well, I think that it's, in, it's in, to some extent intrinsic to care about being successful. <laughs> and it's good to want to succeed at whatever it is we're doing. We don't want to become like somehow an, anti the idea of success. And and I've come to think that even the idea of like wanting to have status isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's a bad thing if you can only get it one way <laughs> through the economy, through money, through material acquisition. And I fear that one of the things we've done actually is that we've reduced the different ways in which you could have status, like in the mm -hmm. community, in the church, in your school in the in the whatever and so we want more pluralism having an important role in society being looked up to is hugely important and that's true for men and women it may be particularly true of men and right now a lot of men feel like they don't have those opportunities to do that that's not true probably of men as lucky as we are but i think for a lot of men they really do think well i'm not quite sure i'm needed in the family I can't get a job because I don't have the skills in this current labor market. Uh, I'm not really attached to any religious institution anymore. I'm not, it's not clear what my role in the community is. So they basically get benched and they don't, there aren't sources of meaning and purpose. Um, and I think that's a kind of deep cultural problem. And so what we need to do is broaden the idea of success. That's, mm. that's me. That's me a long way to get to that. But I think that's, we need different ways, including by the way, being a dad. And so I'll give you one that more data point. There's a, there's a survey question which asks women and men, how important is it in your partner that they are, that they can earn money, right? Their breadwinning potential. And women rank that more highly among men than the other way around. But a female colleague of mine said, that question is just a proxy for having your act together. And will you be a full partner to me? So when I was a stay at home dad, I really prided myself in, in how I did it. You know, I ended up running a local community group and I did the school run and I, we had semi-adopted another kid and, and I was like on it, right? I took great pride in like how I was doing that. And I think that's the question. We, what people want is someone who's like shoulder to shoulder with them in the enterprise and, and that you can get status and success kind of in, in different ways. The trouble is, back to Liz's point earlier, we've broadened the, the ways in which you can get success and status for women in a wonderful way. We haven't done the same thing for men. We still have too narrow a conception of male success, and we have to broaden it. I love the two words you use, purpose and community. I think I just want to put that on blast. Like, you know, how do we attach purpose to softness, to things that can't literally be so tangible, but are just felt like being there for my community? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really good. I think there's a, there's a sort of fragility and a surface level success, and then there's a deepest relational success. I think this point that you, that we're talking about, that it has been broadened for women in a wonderful way, the capacity, the opportunity, and that women should be able to do all these things, and that it's been narrow for men, also speaks to that we see all the things that men have done. We champion those things and we hold those in high regard. So when women are becoming a more right. a part of that, we go, oh, this is great opportunity. But the things that traditionally women have done, we don't hold in that regard. So therefore men are not championed to be in that because we just as a society don't see those things and hold them mm -hmm. really high. So I think then we have to be mindful of when we raise our kids and our boys as I try to do with mine and probably don't do it well enough, but mm -hmm. I'm very mindful to point out and champion, not just women, but feminine qualities, compassion, and things that generally have been attributed to the female sex versus the male, to care for others, to be emotional, to um, share your heart, to take off your armor, to have therapy, 
to champion what a mother means, to take care of another, so much sacrifice goes in that. All of these things that oftentimes boys were like, ah, that's weak stuff, that's weak sauce, that's weak sauce. Why would I ever want to be like a woman? Because that's all weak stuff. We have to retrain our boys in how they see women and also feminine things. And then I just have a quick uh, story that I think think of when, during our conversation. So there's a tribe in Africa that I had visited many years ago in Tanzania. And about eight of us had gone there to visit. And they were just in the middle of changing their culture, which because of this enlightening that one of them had, and they came back and decided to change the way they thought about stuff, which was previously, the whole committee was all men. The women took care of the babies and the men were the workers and all of this. Very, very poor, obviously, in this particular village and all the surrounding villages were not flourishing in their crops and in their education and all this. But this particular tribe decided we were going to add women to our committee. So instead of being nine men, it was now five and four, whatever it was respectively, right? And we were going to have women's voices heard in our tribe, which was nothing of what they had done in any tribe near. Well, as a result, in one year, their crops started flourishing more. And they didn't really have an explanation for it at first. Their crop, crop started, and over five-year time, they tracked this, and tribes around them started watching this one community that things were changing, that their crops were changing, that kids were getting more educated, they were going out, seeing other people, they were bringing that information back. And what changed? The only thing that changed was that women's voices were now being heard. So then the neighboring tribes started doing the same thing. And this whole region in Tanzania... Their crops are flourishing, education is changing, and they're having an effect. And they say the only thing that changed is they included women. Like, they included mm. fucking women. <laughs> what a thought. One thing that someone had said is, even the way they cropped, there was more compassion in cropping where men, men were just like doing it really tough and like holding the tree up this way and being very, very rigid in the way they thought. And a woman thought differently. How about we do it this way? What if we did it with more love and massaged the plants this way, which allowed them to grow differently? Whatever it may have been, none of those things were considered. And I just see that as such an amazing example of how communities and then therefore humanity will flourish and be better when we are equal, mm -hmm. when all of our voices are heard. It benefits men. Mm. It just benefits all of us um, to, to think like that and to do things of that nature. I would say that's the ultimate argument for diversity, isn't it? I mean, that, that's that's the mm. ultimate that's argument for diversity, Yeah, is that, mm. that you, you bring those different viewpoints um, together. We, we can all learn from each other. And you probably wouldn't want it to be all women. No, you right. wouldn't either, because then you'd you'd miss out. You'd lose some of the male perspective. Yeah. I want to compliment this conversation that we've all had because I have a, as a body of culture, I don't often believe in systemic change. It's hard. It's hard to change systems. I do believe in conflict, and I do believe in healthy conversation. Like I think, even that beautiful moment we had between gap and inequality, you know, like actual change happened in like a back and forth. We're speaking different languages. How can we get on the same language? I'm listening to you. You're listening to me. I believe in that, you know, healthy, healthy conflict with healthy conflict. And now I don't know if this is a question. So anyone here can help give me language here. Let's take the NBA, for example. There's only so many spots on a team. So if you, white body, brown body, take my spot, that's my spot. I lose something. There's only so much money a company has to pay people. So if I give women more money, you know, like that's less money for me. There's always conflict in growth, I imagine, because it's like it's them versus us, me versus him. And I feel like something that alt-right people do, your Andrew Tate's again, your, is they're very good at galvanizing around them versus us. Yeah. They're very good at saying, if they gain, we lose. If you get more, I get less. I'm interested in ways, and, and you describe some, maybe you can describe some more. How do we say it's not, it's not you versus me? If we win, you get less. If boys come back on the rise and there's a problem here, women aren't going to lose their, their growth they've had, the evolution they had. Women are still going to have that. Men are also going to have more. How do we make it more expansive and less you versus me? 
I'm not trying to take away anything you've you've gained. Well, I'm, I'll have a first crack at it, but I'd love to hear, <laughs> love to hear what the others think. So I, I agree with you that that's the that's the fatal attraction of reactionary politics, and I would say reactionary influences online generally, which is the zero sum game, which is. It's them versus us. Therefore, if they get more, we get less. And that can be done for race. It can be done for immigration. It can be done for gender. You, you name it. You, you, there's no limit to the ways in which you can frame it as zero sum. And that is almost always not true. It's almost just as a matter of economics, it's not true. Um, you can you There isn't a fixed amount of money that a company can make. If it actually, let's say that it becomes more profitable, because its workers are more incentivized, then it makes more money, right? Mm -hmm. It's not fixed. And that fixed mindset is a real problem. That said, I also think it's important to be honest where there are zero sum games. So for example, there are only ever going to be 100 Fortune 100 companies or Fortune 500 companies. And so if we want more female CEOs, that will mean fewer male CEOs. Mm -hmm. If we want more than one in four of our members of Congress to be women, which I sure do. That will mean fewer men are in Congress unless we expand Congress. But then we have to be careful. I say when, when in, in positions of power and authority like that, because it's zero sum, we have to get the kind of diversity that Jamie was just talking about, precisely because these are positions of authority and power and decision making. So be honest about that. But then for the rest of society, like it's not true, for example, that the fact that women are going to college more means men have to go to college less. We can expand right. our colleges. Let's get more of a growth mindset. That's Derek Thompson's work. And if we had more of a growth mindset than a fixed mindset, then a lot of these zero sum, apparent zero sum games could go away anyway. But there are a few, and I think we should be honest about that, like political leadership and corporate leadership. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, because my fear, you know, with a, with some of the framing of this conversation is is kind of what has happened in the United States between the white working class and the black working class. That like white working class people often, you know, there's a great book called Dying of Whiteness that's all about this that goes into all of the ways that working class white people tend to vote against their own interest in the way that it's defined in this book. Policies like income redistribution, health care, right? And that they were kind of lured into policies that don't serve them by racism, that they have a stronger attachment to their identity as a white person <laughs> than as a working class mm. person who shares a lot of the same concerns as a black working class person. So sometimes I worry that that's what we're doing. And, and I am saying this as a person who then feels com complicit and partially responsible because I do draw a lot of attention to men and women and to this gender category. Mm. I'm like, am I creating a distraction? Again, I mean, I, I kind of alluded to it in my yeah. previous question, but like, is this really just about class? Like, is this just really about, again, a few people at the top who are so happy that, you know, working class men are, are fighting and, and blaming women instead of blaming them for the economic position that they're in or just a despair that they feel in their lives, right? Like, men's wages aren't low because of women. They're right. they're low because of the economy. Elon Musk. And well. again, not to name any names, but like the richest man on earth. Like like he is he's hoarding your money. Yeah, well I think this is a good test of what we were talking about earlier, which is the ability not not just to hold two thoughts in our head at once, but sometimes, you know, three thoughts in our yeah. head at once. Right. So mm -hmm. is it, whatever the it is, is this is it about class really, rather than gender or race? And it the answer is Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's all of those things. So those so the gender gaps, so I'm getting better at this list. The gender <laughs> gaps that we see in education, they're much much bigger at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder than at the top. And they're way bigger for black boys yeah. and girls and black men and women than for any other race, including Hispanic Latino. I mean, the, the, the gender gaps between, for, between black men and black women, black boys are just huge, mm -hmm. which is also partly about class, of course, because mm -hmm. they typically have less economic power. And so mm -hmm. what that leads us to, I think, is like, let's look at who's flourishing and who isn't and what, and what do we need to do to help them. Right. And for sure, I think that leads you to a class lens. But increasingly, I think it, it also leads you to a racial lens because yeah. even controlling for income, for example, black kids just do much worse mm. at school. They're much more likely to be downwardly mobile. Like mm. it's, you, it's not just a class story. It's a race story. But increasingly also gender. And gender plays out differently in different ways. But I do think that there's enough work to be done 
from looking at the specific experience of women in the labor market, for example, or of like men in the education system, that it's still the categories are still useful so long as we don't forget to look at them through other lenses as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Richard, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions more rapid fire quickly. But um, before I do, I appreciate that you've been willing to go in and have a personal conversation along with all of this. Yep. Um, you know, I have seen a bunch of your work and, you know, your talks and um, and I see other people talk and it's great. But when when you just see someone talking data, um, it lands in one place. But when I see a person that I care about that has experience, that tells me who they are, and then shares it, it, it it's received a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things that we like mm-hmm. to do here is have almost like we're having a personal conversation about these things versus a lecture. Um, and you've um, done that really well with us, so I appreciate mm-hmm. that and thank you. Would you mind sharing with us, because you know, well, let me give it a little framing. Uh, this show is called Man Enough, which is really about redefining, undefining masculinity right? Um, It's not about how to be mad enough. Well, maybe it is about how to be mad enough, but in the appropriate (laughs) ways. But oftentimes because of that, and we're finding our way through it, we don't then feel enough. So I would love to know Mm. on a personal level, when is the last time, because you are brilliant, you're articulate, and you've learned a lot, and you're good looking, and you've probably got a little bit of money, and you've got a successful family, and all this stuff. And yet, still tell us, when's the last time that you didn't feel enough? Well, I was wondering about moderating my answer, like calibrating it a little bit, but I think that ship has probably sailed. (laughs) (laughs) Um, uh, So I'll be completely honest. Um, When I was preparing to come on this podcast, I was looking through, I guess, through some of Justin's tweets or some of his posts and uh, it's probably it's a good job he's not here. So I I, I might not share this if he was here, but <laughs> I saw that his book had launched straight onto the New York Times bestseller list, and mine didn't. Hmm. And I had this immediate moment of what? <laughs> so the mm. inner voice was really. I haven't read all of Justin's book yet, but really, his book's better than mine. Why is why is his book doing well? Why is he better than me? Is it because he's better looking than me? Is it because he's more famous than me? This isn't fair. Why, why is my book so bad? Why have I failed? Why hasn't my book done as well as Justin's book? So I immediately went that the inner voice was the immediate male-male competitive comparison to him. And then, of course, you breathe and the quiet voice is, it's great that his book's doing great. We're all on the same team here. This is fabulous. It's not a zero-sum game. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, it's kind of wonderful. But in that moment, mm-hmm. honestly, I was like, Darn it. (laughs) Like, why is Justin better than me? Mm. He is going to. Love Richard. That is, I I can tell you for sure. No, don't, don't use that. Don't share that. (laughs) We got it. No, No, he is going to, and I can, I can say this very confidently. He is going to hear that and he's going to break down crying. For a couple of reasons. No, he's not. One is, yes, he's going to go, yay, I beat Reeves. No, I'm kidding. I know you're <laughs> right. It's exactly yes, he will. What he's maybe a, do. There, there'll be a moment of that, all that stuff, but he will because of a couple of reasons. One is because it's an acknowledgement of his work, and, you know, and, and, and that's great. Yeah. But more because that you were man enough mm-hmm. to say that, to share that, so that others can hear you say it. That we, struggle and that we always don't feel enough and we compare ourselves sometimes and we have to work through that. And that's really a big, big uh, thing that I think that men in general need to learn. And I think you just demonstrated that. So, so thank you. I mean, you have that, you have that moment of whatever it is that's caused it. You have that moment. And and, and to some extent, it's just a, it's a reflex, right? It's not necessarily something you can control, but you don't have to stay in that moment. Mm. You Mm. can go through that moment. You can see yourself in that moment. You can, you're not defined by that moment, but the moment's also real. And it's no point denying the reality of that moment because that doesn't help you get past it. If you don't acknowledge the moment, you get get stuck in it. it. It's acknowledging the moment that allows you to... mm, Yep. I loved you bringing it back to zero sum too, right? Like you said, mm-hmm. it's him versus me. And then I open my heart and I mm-hmm. get a more expansive heart and I say, no, no, no. Mm-hmm. We can all win. Mm-hmm. Yes, we can sir. all win. We can rise together. We can mm-hmm. rise together, right? It's like heart mind. That's what they mm-hmm. call it in Buddhism. Move the mind down here. Expand it. Mm-hmm. Love it. Yeah. Let's, um, so what are some of our closing questions, Liz? 
Okay. Uh, when's the last time that you cried? Oh. Easy. Uh, we're going not deep at all. Um, just last time you, you know, bawled your eyes out. Last night watching um, the final episode of Fleischman is in Trouble oh. where just you see the mom and you see her mental health problems and you see the kind of coming together. It's just like, and mm. what's happening to their marriage is just like, yeah, I'm done. I was bawling. <laughs> Good Love cry. It. Got it. Um, tell, tell us something real quick that brings you joy besides this work and your family. What is something that brings you joy? I love it when one of my sons calls me out of the blue just to do the crossword together, the easy crossword together, which is a bit of a family ritual for absolutely no reason other than just we're terrible at it and it's fun and we just mm. kind of do it. And they're still in their 20s and we still like, I get a call saying, Dad, do you want to do the crossword together? And I'm like, I'm here for that. I love, that. <laughs> love it. Take us home. What does it mean to be man enough? It means being comfortable in your skin a as a man, if that's that's who you are, and finding peace with that and learning that there's a joy and a presence and a, a power in, in being kind of who you are and acknowledging your masculine qualities, if you, if you want to use those terms, I would use those terms, and your feminine qualities and kind of being okay with that and getting to a point where you just... You're not apologizing for who you are, but you are learning that who you are at its best is shown through how you serve others and your relationship to others. That in the end, what defines us, man, woman, et cetera, to be man enough is to be loved enough and to love enough to give more than you take. And then you see it, you see your enoughness in the eyes of the people you love. Mm. And so that's all comes down to that. And everything else is important. Everything else we do, this work, the books, this podcast, the, it's all great. It's part of it. But in the end, it's just that that's when you feel enough is when your partner or your child or your parent or your dying sibling or whoever it is just looks you in the eye and, 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 and let, they let you know that you're enough. Um, by opening their heart to you, but that only happens if you open your heart to them. And that's mm. both the, the most painful and beautiful experience that each of us has the privilege to enjoy. Mm, beautiful. Mm. Well, Richard, on, on behalf of Man Enough, we know and believe that you are indeed enough. Thank <laughs> yes, you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you so I much. Take for, that. For, I, will, I will accept that. Thank you. And thank, thank you for, you for joining our, our, our podcast and sharing your heart and also doing it with a humble posture of learning. Um, and, and being like the messenger, like the me the messenger is the message. Like you, you're taking feedback, you're giving, uh, you're, you know, there's a learning curve for everyone. We learn something, you learn right. something. We all listen to each other. I think it's so wonderful. I'm, I'm so, I'm, I was already a big fan, but I'm an even bigger even fan more so. coming out of this so conversation. Thank you. All the you best in your work where you're doing for it. We clearly see that you care about this and this is, um, in your heart and blood yeah. and whether we agree on every little aspect doesn't matter. The point is, is that you are trying to make a difference yeah, for the better of all of humanity. It. So thank you for that. Thank Thanks for joining you, us. Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Indeed. So Liz, you want to take us out? If you like what you heard, <laughs> check us out. It's manenough.com slash podcast mm -hmm. or wherever you listen to your podcast. Apple, but Spotify, Spotify, all those things. more than the other. YouTube, so apparently, you can watch yes. this one. Yeah, YouTube, you can see our faces and all our mm -hmm. expressions, which I think are good. I think we have good expressions. We do have yeah. great expressions. Good we, curls. This good has curls. Been fantastic. Yes. Right. Tune good in hair. for the curls. Come back and join us again. We um, have more episodes for you. And um, thanks for listening to this particular one with Richard Reeves. It's been amazing. I, I want to say it. Christopher Reeves, by the way, all the time, because you're Christopher and he's Reeves. <laughs> and I'm like Christopher That's Reeves. Christopher. I got to, I don't know if I, we don't have time. I, my name sort of after Christopher Reeves because my mom fell off of a horse when she was pregnant with me. Oh. And because of his money that he put into spinal surgery, she had three spinal surgeries. It's the only reason she can walk. And it's wow. why my name is Christopher Rivas. Fun oh, fact. Like man. and subscribe. Oh, That's no. beautiful. Like oh my God. I love it. Beautiful. Uh, well, anyways, come back and see us again or listen to us again. I'm Jamie Heath. I'm Liz Plank. Christopher Rivas. And this is Mad Enough.